pedestrian got hurt. Amen. It was a man and a little girl. Amen. So I just want to pray for them that God will just have his hand upon them. I don't even know their names. I just know I got to go over there after this. Um, so I want to want to pray for them that God will just be with them. God will help them. Amen. That the man will be that the man will be be good and that he'll be healed and not hurt and and that nothing happened to the little girl. Amen. So I want to pray for them that God will just have his hand upon them. Amen. I want to pray for this revival uh, and the one that is uh, this weekend. I want to pray that God will be with us. They got to help us give each other the mercies, but God will just speak to hearts. They got to just minister to hearts. God's been dealing with me to speak on some things. So I just want to pray that God will just be with us down there. And God will just, uh, just have his hand upon us. Amen. So this evening, amen. Also, we want to pray for our uh, music ministry. Amen. We've been practicing and, and uh, I saw a glimpse of hope last night. Amen. So I want to pray that, that God will amen. just continue moving us in the right direction. Amen. God will... Uh, as scripture says, one heart and one soul, amen, one vision that'll link us together, amen. The unbreakable bond that'll just give us the opportunity to praise God and bring bring some praise and worship into the house of God. Amen. So tonight, amen, if you got a, a need in your life, amen, you can trust in God. And you cry out to God, you worship God, amen. But you trust in God this evening, and you allow God, amen, be the Lord, amen. Whatever it is that you're going through, amen. God is faithful and He can help, amen. 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 So let's let's worship God as we open up the prayer. Hallelujah, my Lord. Hallelujah, God, my Father. We thank you, God, this night, God, for this time and opportunity of giving us, God, to be in your house, to hear your word, God. I pray, God, in the name of Jesus, God, that you just help us, guide us, God. God, meet the needs of your people, God. God, meet the needs right before your precious throne, God. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You take time to greet some of this this, morning, this evening. Amen. This, uh, this evening, that's my announcements. Just want to remind you of our regular services every Sunday morning at 10, every Wednesday at 7. <coughs> um, uh, this weekend, we have the Revival in Tijuana. I want to encourage you to be a part of it. Uh, watch us, amen. We should be online. Amen. See what God's doing. It's going to be exciting seeing what God does, amen, and, and other countries, amen. You know, we take we take for granted that Mexico is so close and Tijuana is just right here, but the realization is it's 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 another country. It's uh, it's if you go down there and you see the way God's moving, and you know God, it's a th it's not a third world country, but it's it's mission works, amen. It's overseas works, amen. So it's a great opportunity, amen. So we're excited about this weekend, um, October first. Uh, Saturday, I'm sorry, Saturday, the September 30th, there's going to be a revival with Jorge Castañeda. He's the pastor in Indio, and uh, it's going to be at the San Diego Church. Uh, we want to go down there and be a part of that, go down there for the service. We go down there for the service and make it come back that night and just uh, be a part of what God's doing down there. Amen. Uh, they always come. They were here this weekend at the San Diego Church. Amen. And it's good if, that they came to support us, but it would be even better if we go down to support them. Amen. So uh, let's go down there. Let's make, let's make plans. We can go down there, get something to eat or whatever, and then make our way back. But it'll be uh, Saturday, September 30th. And don't forget, uh, Rosarito, we got the, the the revival, the Friday the 27th through Sunday the 29th. There's going to be four services, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday morning, and Sunday evening. Amen. It's going to be, it's gonna be uh, 
This is this is a, a well anticipated revival event that we've been trying to plan for the past couple of years, and we're finally coming together on dates, and it's going to be a good good time. So I want to encourage you to be a part of this. Amen. Uh, there's going to be a two day revival here in our church. Amen. Uh, Saturday. And Sunday, uh, November 4th and 5th, we're going to have Pastor Martin Duran from Tijuana. He's going to be here. Uh, him and his wife, Polly, they're going to they're gonna come. He's going to minister. Uh, good man of God, powerful man of God, good friend. So I want to encourage you to be a part of that. Uh, make time, make way. We can be here for that Saturday. Uh, maybe uh, by then we can play a couple songs. Amen. So uh, it's going to be good. Amen. It's going to be really good. We'll be able to do song service by then. And uh, so it's going to be good. Amen. So these are the announcements. We're going to let the put offering. So let's worship God. Amen. You know what? This uh, this evening, you give with an open heart. You allow God to bless you. Amen. You be faithful in your tithes and your offerings. And uh, allow God, amen, to be the Lord of your finances. Amen. Amen. So let's bow our hearts as we bless, bless both the gift and the giver. My Father, we thank you, God, for this time, this opportunity you've given us, given to your kingdom. God, I pray, God, you bless both the gift and the giver, God. God, I pray, God, that you multiply, God. But God, I pour out a blessing upon those hands, God, upon the lives, upon the work, God. God, that we'd be able to give to you, God. And we thank you, Lord. Just let me pray. Amen. Amen. And what a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Seems like I kind of went through song service a little fast. It is because I did. I have a. I gotta take care of something today. But I told them that I can't take care of nothing until I take care of the house of God. Um, so we've been talking about. Uh, we had uh, Brother Angel come up and. I give a couple of scriptures about living clean and then we talked about being the body of, of Christ how we all work together that each of us is an important member in the house of God who you are in Christ is extremely important uh, Sunday I talked about how important it is to have um, your own personal testimony to be a witness and you got to understand who you are in Christ is, is extremely important. Who you are in God, it matters. Because in, in, in the world as a sinner, we're a lot of things. And one of the things that we're not is godly when we're in the world. And the thing is, is when we live for God, we got to become men and women of God. We can't just, we can't expect God to move while remaining the same. You know, you God, there's some expectations in living for God, like living clean. And 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 allowing God to to use your life. You know, there's a lot of people that, that never that that never thought that like for instance tithing was was even biblical until they tithe for the first time. They're like, whoa, what the heck just happened to my finances? Because that's the way God works. People don't realize how important it is to be a man or a woman in take of integrity until you're living for God and you're and you're going through the trials and you're remaining saved. And when things hit, people will stand beside you and say, No, they would never do that because I know that they are a man and a woman of integrity. So I want to get in talk uh, talking about um, living pure and presenting yourself as as a Christian, as, as a man or a woman of God. But in order to do that, we got to get to the root of why you even come. So we don't. One of the things is, if you don't have a vision, you, you you really, 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 really. If you take nothing else, listen to this. If you do not have a vision to do something for God, two things will happen. One, you'll never reach your destiny because you refuse to have a vision. And the second thing is, you will not make it. 
you must have a vision for God. All visions are different. God has a plan for each and every one of us, and it's separate. For some of us, it might be God is giving you a vision to fill the church. And you're and, and God may, may use your life to bring people in. Others may be for the music ministry. But you've got to have a vision. And as you begin to accomplish those visions, God will begin to put new things in your heart. The first thing I ever did was I began to play music. And once I start playing music, next thing you know, I'm doing one thing after another after another. Before you know it, here I am. I'm a pastor now. Because without a vision, we die. Without a vision, there's no purpose. Without a vision, there's no destiny. And without a vision, we no longer have a reason to continue in God. Without a vision, you have no longer to continue living for God, right? Let me give you an, a simple, easy example. When you show up to work, you show up to work... <coughs> for the purpose of a check. Your vision on Monday is to have a check on Friday. That's your vision. You go to work to have that, that, that destiny on Friday of, of receiving that check. But if you never show up on Monday, you'll never get your check on Friday. The only reason why you're even at work is because of a purpose to receive a check, okay? That's the simplicity of it. But you, you can move that into, into the things of God. When it comes to God, it's okay, I'm, I'm coming to church, but why? What's my purpose? Why am I here? What's the vision of God in my life? What's God going to use? And, and if you don't know what God's, what the what the plan of God, the vision of your destiny, then that's then your first one is, your first one is to get one, which means we got to see God. You got to be praying. You got to be reading. You know that you won't know what you can do for God if you're not reading your Bible? You know you can't expect God to give you the vision if you're not talking to him, which is prayer, right? God, you, 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 can't, you can't expect a vision to just fall out of a tree like an apple, right? It doesn't happen that way. you got to seek God. God, you know what, God, what's, give me a purpose for my life. I want to have a reason for being here. you got to seek God for this. And how are you going to know what's God and what's not God? Because there's a lot of people who will say, well, my purpose in the church is this. Well, my purpose in the church is this. But nowhere in that is the Word of God. The Word of God is clear. So if you want to know if your vision lines up with God, how are you going to find that out? By reading the Bible. Understanding the Word of God, right? And part of that is, one, reading your Bible at home. Two, being faithful to church because you get fed the Word of God. So vision is necessary. When you have a, when you have a destiny, you have a reason to push forward. When the trials hit, you will have a purpose for making it through. But without purpose, vision, and destiny, we, without, a, without a purpose, vision, and or destiny, we'll find it easy to give up. If you have no reason to be here, if, you have, if, if you're a girl and you have a boyfriend, if you're a boy and you have a girlfriend, if, if the boy breaks up with the girl, you have, the girl has no business at his house anymore. Why? Because you're not a girlfriend anymore. Right? There's no purpose of being there. Why should I go? If you have a job and they fire you, why would you show up again on Monday? You have no purpose there. No reason to be there. The same thing is in the Word of God. Without a vision, without a purpose, you're not going to move forward. You've got you to continue moving forward. I remember one time my brother told me, and I've shared this before, was... was when I first gave my life to God, I'm sitting there talking to him about Jesus, and he didn't want to listen. And I'm telling him about serving God, coming to church, and just kept inviting him, coming to church, coming to church. And he had told me, he'd go, I don't want to go, because what you're doing, talking about me, living for God, what you're doing is easy. What I'm doing, living in the streets, doing drugs, is, is, is hard. He goes, it's easy. Anybody can do what you're doing. He goes, but not everybody can do what I do, right? Because he was in the streets, doing drugs, getting in fights, all that other stuff. Meanwhile, I'm living clean, living for God, right? So my response to him was simple, and it, was, and it had to be God that gave it to me, because of what I told him was this. I said, if what I'm doing is so easy, then why don't you stop doing what you're doing for one week and come with me, and we'll see which one's easier. He didn't talk to me no more after that. It was done. Conversation was over. He didn't want to hear it no more. Because... If what we do was easy, everybody would be doing it. 
See, what, what you're doing, living for God, making that effort, not everybody can do it. Not everybody does it. It's not simple. It's, the salvation is simple. God, forgive me. I accept Jesus into my heart. Wipe away my sins. I'm sorry, Lord. Amen. Hey, that's simple. But the next day is where the battle begins, where we begin to move forward, remaining saved as things hit us, remaining saved as people come against us, remaining saved as, we're fought into, as we fall into temptation. That's where it begins to get a little harder. But why would you even fight those things if you don't have a reason to, to do it for God? That's why vision and purpose and destiny are so important. Without it, you have no reason to be here. Because if you come because of a person, I guarantee you, that's not going to last. It will not last. It will not last. When you, a person is your reason for attendance, then before you know it, somebody's going to be missing from your life because God doesn't like that. God wants you to be here. He wants you to serve him. Okay? So I want to read Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 through 16. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 through 16. The writing is in red. Right? The writing is in red. The writing is in red. What does that mean? Who's talking? Jesus. Okay, so that means if he's speaking, we should probably listen, right? You know how like when your mom or dad will yell and you got to listen? Well, this is Jesus Christ. He's talking. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 to 16, it says this. It says, you are the light of the world. A city located on a hill cannot be hidden. People do not light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before people so that they can see your good deeds and give honor to your Father in heaven. First portion, first, first, first scripture, 14. You are the light of the world, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. What does that mean? You are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. Let's break it down to two simple things. If you're living for God and you're the light, then what does that mean? Because it says of the world. What does it mean that the world is then? Dark. Dark, right? Okay. What, what does light represent? What does, light, what does the light represent? God. You're the light of the world. God. It represents God. So if the world is dark, what does the darkness represent? The devil. The devil, right? Satan. Okay, so you are the light of the world. Right? You are the light of the world. A city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Right? It says, let your light so shine so that the whole world can see it. Right? What does that mean? If you're the light of the world, right? The light represents God. Right? And the world is, the, is in darkness. That's a representation for, for the world. In darkness, meaning that's where the sinful nature is at. That's where all the evilness, that's where the devil's at, that's where all the other stuff's at, but you're the light of the world. If Jesus is saying it. You're the light of the world. That means, that means you are shining, right? If you get a box that has not, whenever you have a box closed, it's dark inside, right? It's completely dark. You're going to have to take my word for it because you can't see inside of it, right? It's dark. You know there's no light in there. But if you take the lid off the box, does the room get dark or does there light inside the box now? There's light inside the box now, right? So when you take the light, when you take the lid off the box, the room don't get darker. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Darkness doesn't take away light. Light takes away darkness. So the darkness in the box now disappears and now there's light in the box. Okay. If you're living for God and you're the light, you're the light of the world, right? Light of the world, the life of sin, the world of sin. What does that mean? What, what does that mean? He says, you're a city that's on a hill that should not be hidden. Right? What does that mean? If you're the light of the world, what are you supposed to be doing with the light? Shining it. Shining it on what? On the other side. On the darkness, right? Which, which, which is, what's the darkness? Come on, what's the darkness? I just gave you the answer five times. What's the darkness? People and... You just said it. 
Satan. Oh, Satan, sin, right? Okay. Now, when we're talking about darkness, are we talking about the world meaning earth and dirt? What are we talking about? Is that Sinners. Sinners, right? Okay. Sinners. Who are sinners? Me. Who are sinners? Let's break it down. Who are sinners? Martha, she's a sinner. Okay, who's sinners? We are. Well, we're all sinners, but let's 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 break it down. We're we're supposed to be saved. We're supposed to live for God. Who's also sinners? We're the light of the world. We're representing God. Okay, who and we're and and the darkness represents the sinners, right? Who are the sinners? The world. People in the world. But who are they? Who are these people? Souls. Souls. Okay. Do you know any of these people? Yes. Yeah. Who? Don't give me names, just tell me. Family. Co-workers. Friends, co-workers, Strangers. families, right? The guy behind the liquor store. The guy behind the liquor store. Yeah. Right? Now, okay. So those are the sinners, right? They're considered lost. In living in darkness, right? But we're supposed to be the light of the world. Right? And it says we're supposed to be like a a, a, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. What does that mean now? Now that we know that we represent God's light and that people not living for God represent the darkness, and now we know who they are, relatives, friends, co-workers, the guy behind the liquor store, right? <laughs> we know that who, that's who they are. How do we shine our light on them? It's a question. I want to answer. Helping them. Okay. Helping them? Like how? How can we help them? Take the bottle away from them? Take the ball away from them. Bottle. The bottle away from them, okay. Okay, so you take the bottle away from them, but is that going to help them? No, you can still buy them. Okay, what, what, how do we help them? How do we help them? Come on. Come on, how do we help them? Come on. Sister. How do we help them? Inviting them to church. If you're going to take their sin out of their hands, what are you going to replace it with? A bottle. Okay. Praying. Praying. The Word of God, the Bible, right? Witnessing your testimony, who you are, who God is in you, right? Sharing that they're not alone, that there is others like them, and they and God's help. Do you think people feel alone in this world? Yeah. No, people don't feel alone in this world. That's silly. We're, we have billions of people on this earth. How can people feel alone? They must live in a mountain. Mm -hmm. It's not true, right? Is it possible to be around, be in a crowd but still feel by yourself? Absolutely, right? You can feel alone. So if the Bible says that we're the light of the world, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden, that we're to let our light so shine upon the world, which is the darkness, what, how important is living for God now? How would that person here ever see the light of God if we're not letting our light shine. What do you think about that? Because there's people in your life who are living in darkness. People in your life are living in darkness. And they may never see light mm -hmm. until we bring it to them. Yeah. Never. I want you to think about that. That's the responsibility of a Christian. We may never, they may never see the light. But how come it's my fault? How come I got to do it? You know why? Because God knew you could. Yeah. God knew your hurt. He knew your pain. He's seen it. And that's why Jesus Christ died for it. Right? To bring that healing. And it's with that rejoicing that we bring the light into the world. Amen? In verse 16, it says, In the same way, let your shine, light shine before people so that they can see your good deeds. Okay? What are your what's a what's a good deed? Yes. Uh, well, serving God. Uh, but what's a good deed? I mean, serving God, we can say we're serving God, but I will never know until I see you do something with it. Well, the other day I went to the donut spot and the guy asked me for a What are you going to the donut spot for? <laughs> but he asked me for a chocolate milk. They didn't have chocolate milk, but I got him a donut and a hot chocolate. Okay, that's a good deed, right? But now here's the thing: 
when we do the things in the name of ourself, in the, in the name of ourself, we get the glory. But when we do the things in the name of God, in the name of God, God gets the glory. Think about this. We have a choice. You know what, sir? There's no cold chocolate, but I got you some hot chocolate and here's a donut. Oh, thank you, sir. I appreciate that. You know what? God bless you, man. You know, do you have a moment while you're drinking your, co your, your, your chocolate? I want to let you know about something. Oh, what is that? He's going to talk to you because you just got it for him. Mm -hmm. You know what? A while back, you know what? I was going through some things and God really touched my life and it's really changed me. There was a time in my life where I didn't care about other people and I, I was heartbroken. Mm -hmm. But God's really coming in my life and I just want to let you know that, you know, God can help you, man. So you turned the good deed into the shining light of God. Does that make sense? So good deeds. Now, will good deeds get you to heaven? No, right? Because we just did an example, right? The deed of giving them the chocolate and the donut was the same. Nothing changed in, the, in this narrative, right? In this, in this illustration, nothing changed. Same chocolate, same donut. Except the recipient. He either received it as, that was a nice guy, or he received it as, man, I ran into another Christian today. God's trying to talk to me. Mm -hmm. Right? Follow me? I picked up somebody today. I'll tell you what it is later. They came to this church before. And I was Ubering over there. They came to this church before. And they didn't, they didn't know, they didn't rec they didn't know it was me, right? And they get in. Usually everybody gets in on the passenger side of the back. Right? This one walked around and got it behind me. So then I go, I go, I know you. She goes, You do? How? So then I said who I was. She goes, oh, hey. She goes, I didn't even see your face. She didn't see my face. I said, okay. She goes, man, God must, God must really be trying to talk to me, right? Because I made sure she remembered who I was from where, right? So when you do a good deed in the name, in the name of yourself, hey, you're a good person. Good person. But do good people die and go to hell? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's, the Bible says, unless a man is born again, he will not shall not and cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So good deeds are no good deeds. You cannot. It's good deeds in the name of God. Are you bringing Christ in this situation? See, the situations like, like, like he's talking about, that is the perfect opportunity because the door opens up wide to have that conversation with the person now because you, you just entered into his life. You give him a meal. You're talking to him. So you now you have an open door. So it says, it, that's why it says, he says, he says, let your light shine before people so that they can see your good deeds. And then what? It says, and give honor to your Father in heaven. Do you know that when you do something like this in the name of God and give them the God, you did a good deed because you were able to on the physical part, but you, do, but you give them God, you do it in the name of God. You give honor to God. That person, they leave talking about, man, you never guess what happened to me. What happened to you today? Well, you know what? I was over there by the gas station. This guy came out, you know, he, he told me I was hungry and he came and brought me food. He did? Yeah, he was a Christian guy. He won't remember your name, but he'll remember your God. He'll always remember your God. Yep. He might not remember your name. may not remember your face, but he'll remember your God. It's important. Mm -hmm. You always bring God. I've shared the story before. I don't know if you guys heard this one, but there was a time I had just given my life to God. We're out outreaching, passing out flyers in, in, in apartment complexes or wherever we were at in Ontario, knocking on doors back in the, in the mid 90s. Knocking on the door and I pass a flyer and I, I see a guy, I give him the flyer and I begin to tell him my testimony. He begins to listen and I ask him, hey, you know, can I pray with you? Well, yeah, you can pray with me. So I prayed with him and he gets saved. And I'd like to invite you to church. Hi, right, praise God, okay. And, but the guy never showed up to church, never came, not even once. Forgot about the guy. Don't know anything. Fast forward 10 years later, I'm sitting in my car and I hear somebody say, Ben, Ben. I turn and say, he goes, hey, Ben. And he comes all the way to the car. And I'm like, oh man, who is this guy? I don't know who this guy is. It was that same guy. He goes, you may not remember me. He goes, but one day you knocked on my door and you gave me a flyer and asked me if I wanted to accept Jesus Christ and I did. And I never went to your church, and I'm sorry I never went to your church. He goes, but just so you know, my family's Christian, and they have a church. So I went to their church. 
He goes, and I, and I, he goes, he goes, believe it or not, I just prayed for you saying, God, show me this man again. He goes, because when you prayed with me, I gave my life to God. I started going to church. And right now me and my wife are getting ready to pastor our first church. We made a difference. And all I do is knock on his door. Here's a flyer. And I pull out your church. Yeah, pray to you. Okay. Move on with my day. All right. And it says, he says, let your light shine. He says, and let your good deeds and get that it gives honor to your father in heaven. You don't think that gave honor to our father in heaven? That's how important what you're saying is, is to people. By witnessing to this one guy who I never seen again and didn't see for 10 years, by doing that, he now passes a church, him and his family, and other lives are being touched. Other cities are being touched because of that. That's how important you are to God. That's why it's important you get a vision. You got to have a vision. You got to have a purpose. So first impressions make a difference. Do you guys know that first impressions make a difference? First impressions make a difference. This this always comes down to also like coming to church. The way we, you know that the way we come to church makes a difference. Well, I don't know why I get dressed. The Bible says you know, God just takes you the way you are. You did. Thank you, Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for you, just the way you are. And then. Then when he shed his blood, he asked you to change for him, right? Old things pass away, behold, all things come new. And first impressions are everything. If, if we all dress like we just got out of work, and we're all dirty and everything, and we invite people into church, like, man, I didn't go to that church. They all smell. They just got out of work, right? I don't go over there. But when they come to church and they see you groomed and dressed nice and, and, and first impressions, praise God, man. I'm glad you made What was your name? Oh yeah, what was your, what was oh, man, praise God, I'm glad you guys made, you guys never around here? You guys, you know, how'd you guys hear about us, man? It's great, man, you know, say wherever you want, you want a water? I'll get you a water. You don't think they're going to go home and remember that? I went to that church, and man, they, and they were very welcoming there, right? First impressions make a difference. You don't need to be the pastor of the church to do that. You don't need to be an usher. You know what you need to be? Godly. Amen. And a Christian. Because that greeting isn't for the usher only. It's not for the pastor. It's not for anybody with a title. That type of greeting is for anybody who's accepted Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. If you're saved, then that's the kind of greeting we give. So first impressions really makes a difference. We must always be prepared to be, to be presented as a man or a woman of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. Anybody have any questions, any input? Anyone else give out donuts? No? You have any extra donuts? I, I like that donut. I like to have a donut right now. <laughs> Ten what? First like, uh, Corinthians six twelve. This is a, this is a scripture I've used, and you should have highlighted in your Bible. And you need to understand this, especially young people. You need to understand this. Not only young people, but even older people, because we get so caught up in our own minds as we get older that we think what I think is the right way. That's it. Okay. For, uh, First Corinthians chapter six verse twelve says, "All things are lawful for me." I'm going to stop right there. What does that mean? All things are lawful for me. What does it mean? Lawful. What does lawful mean? What is law? What's law? We know obey. what law is, huh? Obey. Obey. Right. You gotta obey the law, but what's the law? Follow the law. Follow the law. There's a set of rules, right? This is what this is what I can do. This is what I can't do. I can do this. Why? Because the law says I can do this. Right? I don't do these. Why? Because the law says I can't. But the law says I can do this, so guess what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna color in the lines and I'm gonna do everything that's in the law. Okay? It says all things are lawful for me, right? Name something that you can do that's not illegal. I'll name something. Eating. It's not illegal to eat, right? Walk around without shoes. Walk around without shoes, right? It's, 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 it's not illegal. Who's dirty? Riding a bike. That's not illegal. You can do that, right? Drinking. No. If you're, if, you're, if you're walking without shoes in a, in a restaurant that says no shoes, no shirt, no service, then you're in trouble. You, fought, you broke the law, right? Okay. Eating. Eating is lawful. Eating the wrong things is not, right? Edibles, right? That's that's the new thing. It's lawful, right? So what's 
not lawful that you can do, okay? What, what is lawful that you can do? What are things that are lawful that you can do but you probably shouldn't? Because this is what it says. It says, it says, all things are lawful to me, but not everything is beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be controlled by anything. Okay? I will not be controlled by anything. Mm -hmm. Right? So, <clears throat> if you are the age of 21 or older, just by me saying that, what can you now do? Drink. Buy alcohol, tobacco, drugs. First thing, right? Well, not drugs. They're still illegal. Because according to the state of California, marijuana is no longer a narcotic. Right? According to the state of California, because that's the law. But you're 21. You can do all those things. Could gambling go into that as well? Gambling, right? Mm -hmm. You can go gamble, right? You can go gamble. It's, hey, it's, it's lawful. <laughs> Right? It's lawful. It, the law says you can do it, right? But what does Paul say? He says, all things are lawful for me, but what? But not all. But not everything's beneficial. Right. Just because it's legal to gamble, is it beneficial? Is it beneficial? I guarantee you there's a lot more lotto losers than there are lotto winners. I absolutely guarantee you that. I guarantee you more people miss the jackpot than hit the jackpot on a slot machine. I guarantee you. If it wasn't so, casinos wouldn't be so rich. Right? Now, he says, I will not, I will not, he says, he says that I will not be controlled by anything. Okay? Oh, that's okay. I can, I can, I can gamble. I'm good. Well, and then when you don't have your house payment, your mortgage, your rent, right? When you stayed out all night because you couldn't get off the car table and you realize, oh, dang, it's five in the morning. I got to hurry up and get to work. You didn't sleep. Okay. Right? It's not beneficial. Paul says just because it's legal doesn't mean you should do it. So when people tell you, oh, come on, you can have one drink, it just says I'll be a drunk. You can have one, ah, one drink. Is it beneficial? Okay. Now take that. Smoking weed. It's lawful. But you, you, you got to be a special kind of dumb to believe it's beneficial. Because it's not. you got to be a special kind of person to think that. It, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not beneficial. Right? But it's lawful. Right? Uh, but like when they do that, they don't realize that the law is actually giving you a catch-22. And what I mean by that is like okay yes it's legal but if you're doing this and you're under the influence of that you're gonna get busted you're gonna get a ticket you're gonna pay this so it's like you're so blinded to what they're saying that you're only choosing oh well it's legal is it really because now the police want to stop you because they need your thousands of dollars so they can get paid that's what it is period absolutely right so just because it's legal doesn't mean we should do it. Just, just because it's, it's lawful doesn't mean we should do it, right? Now, when, when, when I've said this before, let's see who was listening. As a Christian, a man or woman living for God, you're allowed one day to be selfish. What day is that? The day you accept Jesus Christ. The day you accept Jesus Christ. Right, why? Because that's the day you surrender. That's the day you say, God, my hands are up. I can't do anything. I can't help no one. I am useless. I am I am weak. It is about you coming helping me today, God. But after that day, what do we do for the rest of our life? We live for who? God. We live for God, right? The rest of our lives, we live for God. To We are to give glory to who? And God. But in what do we give glory to God? The Bible says what? Everything. In all you do, do as unto the Lord, right? Everything you do, do as unto the Lord. We give glory to God in every day of our life after we've accepted Jesus Christ. We're allowed one day to be selfish because that's the day we needed Jesus Christ to return our lives and begin to change us and let us know that, you know what, we matter, okay? After that, we live for God. So now, let's take that and let's add the first scripture, right? Let's add the first scripture where we've talked about and it says, you are the light of the world, a city on the hill, right? 
They can't but not be hidden. We're to bring the word of God to the center, to the world of darkness. Let me give you this chocolate. Let me give you this donut. And oh, let me tell you about my God. Because my God is self in my heart to be able to talk to a person like you. Because mm -hmm. you know what? God has a plan for your life. Just as he has a plan for my life. And I would love to be a part of that plan in your life. Right? So we're giving it, we're giving it to him. Right? But now, now Paul's saying, Paul's saying, all things are lawful, but not everything is beneficial. Mm -hmm. Okay, beneficial, right? What does the word beneficial mean? To profit, to gain from, right? Once we give our lives to God, the day, first day is selfishness, right? Me, 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 God, thank you, Lord. Day number two, what do we do? God, I'm giving back to you. I'm going to help your people. I'm going to reach the loss for you. The light of the world, God, we learn to do that the rest of our lives, right? But it says not everything is beneficial. For a man and a woman of God, what is beneficial? Building the kingdom of God, right? Bringing souls to Christ. Getting the law saved. That's beneficial to the kingdom of God. So it says it may be lawful, but it's not beneficial. Beneficial to who? To God. But then he also says, and he says, and I should not be controlled by anything. So now, beneficial or controlled? Let's think about this. Lawful. I can do anything. It's lawful. I'm okay. You got your friends telling you, left and right. You can have one beer. You know what? I tell you what. You don't. You don't smoke it. I'll smoke it, and you just you just get the you get the secondhand smoke high. That's okay. No, 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 no. That's not beneficial. Why? Because it's not benefiting the kingdom of God to get people saved. Now, just because it's lawful, it's not beneficial, and you should not be controlled by anything. Presentation is everything. Impressions are everything, right? How will it look as you're sitting there drinking one beer, not getting drunk, staying away from being a drunkard, not inheriting the kingdom of God, but your friend is still struggling, struggling to make a decision, but sees that your impression of what a Christian should be or what a godly man or woman should be is somebody who can stand there with everyone else drinking a beer still. Somebody who can stand still, sit and stand in that same garage where everyone else is getting high. It's not beneficial, right? And that should not be controlled by anything. Now, what do you think it means when it says controlled by anything in this scenario? All your friends are together, they're all doing that, right? Mm -hmm. I should not be controlled by anything. Well, the drugs ain't controlling you, the getting high ain't controlling you, the drinking ain't controlling you. You've learned to get rid of those, right? But now you're in the middle of it. And you don't know how to say, you don't know how to say, no, I can't be here. You don't know how to say, you know what? It's time for me to leave. But they're my friends, right? I'm not drinking. I'm not getting high. They are, not me. Right? But, but Paul says, I'm not going to be controlled by anything. Because we don't know how to leave. We don't know how to say, God, you know what? I'm out of here. Because what I'm doing here is not beneficial. By not being able to have the strength to say, I need to leave. I'm being controlled by something. He says, and nothing, I should not be controlled by nothing. That's what Paul says. He says, it may be lawful, right? It's not beneficial, and I'm not going to be controlled by it. It's lawful. They can do it, and they ain't getting drunk. That's, that's good. You can go ahead and win that argument all day long. But you know what? I'm not going to be controlled by it either because I am a representation of Jesus Christ. I am the ambassador. The guy across the street who sees me every time they open up that garage door, only thing he knows is that I'm in the room full of smoke. And I'm that same person. Mm -hmm. Make sense? So who we are has to be important to us. When we're in a conversation, can those that overhear you tell that you're a Christian? If you're in a conversation, can those around you, can they know that you're a Christian? The way you dress... The way you present yourself, when people look at you, do they know no, that's a Christian? Do they know? Do they know that that's a Christian? Because this is important. Because women can dress a certain way that is very ungodly, mm -hmm. but still say, I'm, I'm living for God. That's, that's a, mm -hmm. No, 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 no. You can't do that. Right? Do people know that you're a Christian when you walk into a room? Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I got one scripture, but we're going to go, we're going to read it a couple times in a couple different ways. The scripture is simple. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. It's a very familiar portion of the scripture, but I want to read it in a couple versions that they have it. 
2 Corinthians 6.14. It says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness? Unequally yoked. To give you the vision of the yoke, they, they always talk about the yoke of the oxen because there are always a lot of farmers during the time, the biblical times. They'd have two oxen, and the yoke was was the wooden harness that would get the both oxen together. Okay? And what they would have to do, they would have to get the two oxen or two horses or two mules, whatever they were pulling, they had to be of equal size and strength. If they were not of equal size and strength, they could not pair them up together because one would be dragging the other. They would be pulling each other. And because it's on its neck, you're going to either snap the neck, hurt it, drag it, and you're not going to have that animal no more. The animal was part of their workforce, so they couldn't do that. So you have to get two animals, two of the same animals that were of equal strength and ability. You're not going to get an old one with a younger one because it's not going to be equal. So you had to get two of the same, right? That was Second Corinthians? That not was first, right? first. Second Corinthians 6, 614. So you got to get them both the same. So right here, Paul says, he says, do not be unequally yoked with the unbeliever, right? What does that mean? Unequally yoked. Now, you're the oxen, right? Don't be unequally yoked with the unbeliever. It's immediately telling you that an unbeliever is unequal to you. Your unbeliever is unequal to you. In the streets, you have what we would call road dogs, right? Where I go, he goes. Where right? he goes, I go. I leave, he, and he's with me. I'm coming back with him. Whether we're coming back together, I'm carrying him, or I'm bringing him in a body bag, but I ain't leaving him behind, right? That's my road dog, okay? That guy can't be in my, can't be yoked to me. He can't be yoked to me because we're not equal. I'm moving forward in things of God. Now, if I'm in the streets, yeah, I can be yoked to him because I'm in the streets. Hey, that's, that's what it is. But he's not my equal no more. Why? Because I'm a man of God. I'm living for God. So it says, don't be unequally yoked with the unbeliever because the unbeliever is going to drag you down. Remember, you get two oxen or two horses. You get an old one and a young one. What's going to happen? The stronger one's going to pull and drag the younger one, right? And what happens to the what happens to the weaker one? When it gets drugged, it gets hurt if it doesn't die, right? It may die because it's being drugged. When we tie ourselves to a sinner and make them our best friend, when you tie yourself to a sinner and that's where you live with them and that's where you stay with them, and what I mean is, you're doing what they do, hanging out where they hang out. Somebody's dragging somebody. And I guarantee you, the Christian is not dragging the sinner. Nope. We're being unequally yoked. We use that scripture a lot when it has to do with marriage. That's why that's why people always wonder, well, how come the Jews, they only marry Jews? They don't want to be unequally yoked. That's right. That's exactly what it is. Why do Muslims only marry Muslims? They don't want to be unequally yoked. Why do Jehovah's Witnesses only marry Jehovah's Witnesses? Unequally yoked. Mormons, unequally yoked. But Christians, I can do all things to Christ who strengthens me. <laughs> Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Mm -hmm. No, no, let's get back to the yoke. Right? Get back to the yoke. If you want to make it in God, you've got to be around people of God. It's the way it is. Does it mean that you ignore the people who are not in God? No. Does it mean that you never talk? No, no, no. What it means is be strengthened in the things of God mm -hmm. so that when the weaker comes near you, you're going to be able to pass on that strength to them. Okay? So in, in New, King, New King James Version, it says, Do not be unequally yoked with, with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? What fellowship? The word fellowship means communion, the coming together, partnership, right? That's what fellowship means. For what fellowship, what communion, what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Okay, let's clarify. Righteousness. When it's when in this verse where it says, has right righteousness with lawlessness. What represents righteousness and what represents lawlessness? Okay, remember, everything's lawful, but it's not beneficial. So we know what law is. So lawlessness. What's a lawlessness? Who's lawless? Lawless. Huh? Lawless. Or lawless. Um, the unbeliever. The unbeliever. Lawless or less law or no law. The right? The lost. 
Righteousness. Where do you find righteousness? In God, right? So who do we represent? God. So what does righteousness have with lawlessness? What does people of God have to do with people of sin? Other than bringing salvation? Nothing. And I say this with confidence. I say it because I lived it. I had a group of friends that I loved to death, and they would literally die for me. They would literally kill for me. We've been in some battles. But when I gave my life to God, I cut them all loose. I cut all of them loose. I still love them. To this day, I still care for them. I found them on Instagram. Right? And, and, I, and I know who they are. But I love my God more. Amen. In order to get them to heaven, I gotta have to be stronger than God. You understand that? I'm not saying you, you don't ever, your family, your friends, I'm not saying you, you, you ignore them. What I'm saying is you you get strengthened for them. Because if you don't strengthen yourself, you're not gonna be you're gonna be no spiritual good to them. You gotta be strengthened. So it's that you we read that one. Here's another version. Do not be partners with those who do not believe. For what partnership is there between righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship does light have with darkness? Here's another version. Do not be mismatched with unbelievers. For what partnership is there between righteousness and lawlessness? Right? We are to be men and women of God, living for God. If what we did was easy, everybody would be doing it. I'm not saying you have to ignore your family. That's not what I'm saying at all. If that's what you think, you're missing the point. What I'm saying is we always have to be a representation of God. We always have to be the Christian. We don't have a timeout. You know that we don't have timeout. Christians don't have timeouts where we say, oh, you know what, today it's my, my, my cheat day. You know, like diets, we have cheat days on diets. So it's my cheat day. Um, I, can, I can talk like a sailor today and, and just cuss. It's my cheat day. I can go to strip clubs today. It's my cheat day. It doesn't work that way in the kingdom of God. It's my cheat day. I can do drugs today. I can get high today. It's my cheat day. I can get drunk today. It's my cheat day. That's, that's the way it is in God. There is no cheating God. It's living for God. That's it. You just live for God. So you got to understand how important this is to live for God. That's why when I started, I said, I said this. If we do not have a vision, purpose, or destiny, then we no longer have a reason to continue. In order to accomplish everything else, that's where it starts. Mm -hmm. Why are you serving God? What, what is the plan of God in your life? What is that vision? What's that next thing you're going to work towards? What are you working towards? Those of you who are doing music, hey, that's your vision right now. Yes. Work towards it. Complete that vision. Mm -hmm. And watch God open up more doors. Mm -hmm. Especially with music. I think music is such a wonderful thing, especially in church. Because it's so challenging to learn. And it takes dedication and commitment. Mm -hmm. And once you accomplish it, God begins to open up your eyes to understand that, man, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do this. It, it, it breaks barriers that you didn't know you had. It challenges in a way you didn't know you were going to be challenged. But it's catching the vision and following through because, because with that music comes commitment. Yep. Right? Mm -hmm. oh, man, i got to be there now. I gotta be the matter of fact, how should I gotta be there early now? So I gotta be there early now. Right? Comes commitment. And you do it. Why? Because God gave you the vision and He's helping you see your way through it. Yeah. That's how important the ministry that we're that we're starting right now. That's how important that is. It's so important to the success and what God wants to do in your life. It's important that, that, that you find what God wants. And it's okay. God God will give you something. God will give you something that you're gonna that you're gonna accomplish and you're gonna move forward in. You're gonna expand and God's gonna get glory and people will be saved. Right? Any questions, any input? Anyone? Anyway. Right? Anyone one once, anyone one twice? So no questions. Alright. So we're gonna end right there. We're gonna end right there. Um, don't forget to pray for the revival in Tijuana. And we will have service here on Sunday. Amen. God's gonna, it's going to be good. God's going to move. Amen. And uh, amen.
So take this home, be the light of the world, be the city on the side of the hill that cannot be hidden. Remember a box that has a lid on it is dark. The moment you take that lid off, the light will go into the box. The darkness doesn't go into the room. It doesn't work that way. You have the ability to shine. If you don't feel confident that you do, continue serving God and you'll see God automatically gives it to you and you don't even know it's there. Yeah. You'd be surprised how many people are already, are already bringing honor to what God's doing in your life. Mm -hmm. Amen. So let's, let's bow our hearts as we close our prayer. No, Father, we thank you, God, today, God, for your word, for your message, God. God, I pray, God, in the name of Jesus, God, that you just help us, God. God, that you continue, God, to put these words in our hearts, God, that we would live for you, God, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.